I am very, very happy to now have a permanent researcher and writer on the team. I have been researching and writing these cases by myself for years. Even though I love what I do, it's very difficult to bring it to you guys week over week, but now with the team, it is possible. But with the team means that now Sinister has ads. We'll throw them in the beginning, be nice to researcher and writer, they see your comments, maybe even say hello, and welcome our first sponsor. Today's sponsor is Squarespace. I trust Squarespace so much that I built my own website with Squarespace for Sinister without even knowing that they were gonna become one of the sponsors. And now I have a discount code. That aside, building the Sinister website myself took 30 minutes from the build to payment. I think it's really cool how easy it is to do everything because I used to code websites when I was a kid and back in the day you had to type out all the coding, all the CSS, upload it to like some FTP program, check the website and eh, da, da, da. no, it is way, way, way simpler. And anybody now can start a website for their business or passion project in literally minutes. I'm not exaggerating. Not only do they make the design incredibly easy, but if you don't wanna type out big blocks of text to fill out your website, try Squarespace AI. You don't have to write product descriptions, you don't need to write biographies, just put in the tone that you want it to be in and a couple descriptions of what you're trying to get and Squarespace AI will spit it out. Best of all, like I said earlier, I have a discount code for you and the payments are flexible. You guys can head to squarespace.com sinister and get 10% off of your first website. Or you can just go to squarespace.com, sign up, and use our code SINISTER at checkout. How easy is that? Dion Ba was a 28-year-old college student. Yes, she started college a little bit later, but she still struggled through school like everybody else. Dion didn't have any scholarships, she didn't have much money, but rent was still due and she had to eat. Sounds familiar, right? So many people have lived this literal nightmare cramming for tests, eating crappy food, taking a second job, struggling day and night, wondering if it's all gonna be worth it. But one day, Dion meets a millionaire and all he wants to do is take care of her. He's sending her gifts, he's sending her cash, he even bought her a car. But most importantly, rent and tuition are paid for. It's the dream, right? But Dion has one problem. She's married. This is a show about female killers. This is Sinister. It's another Monday, and you are listening or watching Sinister. Uh, it's a show hosted by me, Bose, where we dive into the depths of female killers. I was somebody that grew up watching Deadly Women and Snapped, and I'm just very interested in the complexities of female killers. So that is what we focus on here. If you're interested, make sure you follow, subscribe, whatever it is. And if you are listening on Apple or Spotify, please rate the podcast five stars. I put a lot of work into this. We recently got some new team members and they are working so, so, so hard over here to deliver these stories to you. If you're new, I handpick all of these cases and I spend days to weeks working with a researcher going through all of the details. So a lot of these I'm very, very passionate about. And of course it comes through in my stories. If you don't hate that, I'll see you next Monday on the next Sinister, but for now. Dion Ba is textbook irresistible. She was an immigrant from Jamaica and she has the slightest Jamaican accent. She's very petite, she's very polished, she's very, very pretty. She also is going to college for finance, she's very smart, and she had a good job as an executive secretary. She worked for MARTA, the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority. To most guys, Dion was a total catch. Smart, pretty, able to take care of herself. Now, I mean, she was struggling a bit in college, but she figured out a way to make it through. Also, she had a little bit of help from her husband, but he didn't have too much to give her. He did have a good job. He was a pilot with Jamaica Airlines. 
And this wasn't just a starter marriage. She and her husband, Sean Peter Nelson, they already had a child together. They had met in 1988 in a nightclub in Miami and they hit it off. One thing that you'll notice about Dion is she's pretty attracted to prestige. And back in the 80s, because we're in about the mid 90s or so, the 80s and the 90s, being a pilot was hot. It was such a fantastic job. I mean, even now it is, but you know, Pan Am was running a bunch of commercials. To be a flight attendant or to be a pilot then, it was a hot job. So Dion's in school for finance. She's got a child. She's also married to this pilot. But her husband, Sean, is in and out of town a lot. To be honest, he's rarely home. Pilots have really, really busy schedules. When they first met, they really, really, really hit it off because Dion was originally from Jamaica, but she had immigrated years, years, years later. She was already a naturalized citizen in America. And then Sean was from Montego Bay, but he was living in Miami at the time. That's where they met, where he was getting his pilot license. And he was immediately smitten by Dion. Not only could she cook traditional Jamaican food, which they both really bonded over, but also, she was very, very seductive. She had a lot of passion. She had a lot of energy. And basically, to both of them, the sex was great. Within two years, they were married, she was pregnant, and they kind of settled into their life. They left Miami and went over to Georgia, and that's kind of where we are now. Now, in the early stages, when they had first moved to Georgia, Sean was still completing the training for his pilot license, and Dion was also in school. One thing that I thought was really weird though was Dion was always disappointed that he didn't want more. She was always on him about furthering his education and doing more. (laughs) This is such an interesting detail because I'm like, what is past the pilot? How do we move forward from there? She kind of would get on him about not being super, super ambitious because she liked the finer things in life. I think that she wanted the status of my husband's a pilot and I'm in finance and da, 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 da. And she wanted to be looked at like one of the high society people. And so she would really, really push Sean to get more into business, get more into finance. You have to want more. And at the time, he had barely even finished his pilot's training and she was already all on top of him. Sean's job took him away from home quite a bit and Dion would use this time while he was gone not to take care of their child, but rather to go hunting for men in Atlanta that could possibly give her a nicer lifestyle. One day in April 1996, she gets an opportunity. Remember I said earlier that Dion was his assistant or at this time, secretary? That means that she received any and all mail that came to the door and usually she would filter through it before she gave it to her boss. Well, one day when she's going through the mail, she sees this extravagant looking invitation. It's an invitation for a party directed to her boss. The invitation says that there's a plus one allowed, it's for a birthday party, invite only. And this is a lavish birthday party being held at the Hilton in Atlanta. Dion sees the invite and she knows the type of people that she wants to meet, they're gonna be there. This is one of those high society, new rich, just parties that she has to be at. Dion's priorities were not school, not her husband, not her child. She was looking for more. This is crazy to me. Dion sees the invitation and she asks her boss, hey, what is this? And her boss says, oh, this is a party for Lance Herndon. He's a tech executive here in Atlanta. And she says, I would love to go. Is there any way that you can get me in? And her boss is like, well, it's invite only. You kind of have to know somebody, but you know what? Let me see what I can do. Dion's a really pretty woman, and I think her boss kind of felt like, you know, nobody will mind if she's there. They, They probably, in fact, would welcome it. It's kind of a club environment, and it was a big party. It was Lance Herndon's 41st birthday party. So her boss does her a favor, and he asks another person on staff, hey, did you get that invite to Lance Herndon's party? And the guy said, yeah, but I kind of tossed it because I wasn't planning on going. And her boss bends over backwards for her and says, can you reach back out and re-request the invite? Dion wants to go and let's just give her your invite. Like if you're not going and she can't be your plus one, see if she can just take the paper and flash it and get in. 
And he said, sure, I'll see what I can do. And the employee agreed, sent over a fax, and within a few moments, Dion Ba had an invitation to Lance Herndon's 41st birthday extravaganza. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Lance Herndon. Lance was known in the Atlanta scene as the Black Gatsby. He was a multimillionaire who made most of his money in the tech business. He had a company called Access Inc. His company was recognized with revolutionizing the city's 911 program, and he was looking to expand. He was very well versed in computers, and he integrated a lot of technology that basically made everything much more efficient. And he made a lot of money off of this. There were news articles about him. There was magazines. At one point, he was even listed in the America's Top 500 Entrepreneurs, which is honestly a really crazy feat. At one point, President Bill Clinton even gave Lance Herndon recognition as a promising young entrepreneur. Everybody knew who he was. He was so ahead of the curve with technology. He believed in computers. He understood computers. And he took his business very, very seriously. He was even like having conversations with Coca-Cola, Delta, anything. His computer technology business was going to blast off. And he was a hard worker. A couple of other really interesting details that I learned about Lance was when he was growing up, he was very, very close with his paternal grandfather. And that side of his family taught him, you get up early in the morning and you get to work. You get started before anybody else. And that's the way that Lance operated. Inside of his bedroom, there were three different alarm clocks and they would all go off in different increments. 3.40 a.m., 3.50 a.m., 4 a.m. And on the third one, Lance was a pretty heavy sleeper. He would wake up and get going. His first act of business, because he was kind of a creative, was to go downstairs before his employees got in at like 7 or 8 a.m. And what he would do is he would go to a tape recorder and he would have tapes laid out for all three of his main employees that were coming in day by day. The office was inside of his house, but the house was kind of blocked off. So nobody went into the house and they kind of stayed in the separate office that was kind of like a basement that had a separate entrance. So he would go down to the facility and he would start to record a message each morning at 4 a.m. for his employees to know what they had to get done that day. So he'd start the recording and say, uh, good morning, Marguerite, this is Lance. Uh, here's what I would like to accomplish today. And he would list off a task that, or multiple tasks that he wanted people to complete before the end of the day. They had to kind of like have all the files prepared, have everything listed off, and they would leave it on their desk at the end. Now, a lot of Lance's employees, they worked there for like three or four years. They were actually pretty happy. They were paid well. They knew what to expect coming into work every day. It was a pretty cushy job. And I think that they knew they were ahead of the curve with technology. And I mean, his company was huge. He was pretty famous. Also, his mom actually worked for him as well in bookkeeping, and everyone was pretty happy. Lance was very particular about his day to day. He was kind of a man of short stature, and so he really concentrated all of his energy, everything into, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna be successful, and you are going to notice me. And he was built for this, okay? He liked routine, he was a creature of habit. He was also very, very particular. For example, Lance would take three showers a day. He just had to. He didn't like being dirty. He liked feeling clean. He liked to have his suits pressed. He liked to have all of his accessories. Lance even usually liked to take a little nap in the middle of the day when he was working. And people said that when Lance was sleeping, he would sleep with his arms perfectly folded over so that he didn't crease his suits. Everything was dry cleaned. Everything was picture perfect, immaculate and in order. And this worked because business was booming. Now, back in the 90s, there was a big influx of black professionals that came to the Atlanta scene. Like, you know, the weather was a little bit warmer than some northern or midwestern states. And there was a lot of opportunity tech jobs, government jobs, everything. And the black community was booming here. There was a lot of professionals, some of the kind of new rich, like people that didn't come from heritage money, but had recently come into money. And they were all socialites. It was a very buzzy scene and everybody wanted to be a part of it. 
Lance was the ultimate socialite. People would give anything to be at a table with Lance Herndon. He was always doing the cocktail circuit, having meetings with people after work, Monday through Friday on the weekends. He was out partying. He would throw his own parties. Like I said, Lance was the Black Gatsby. The business was growing. He had a double digit increase in revenue within like the last couple of years and everyone knew him. So he was just able to call in favors anywhere and everywhere he wanted. I mean, he was in the prime of his life and he built it all himself. Quite frankly, it was really beautiful. But with money, with success, and with fame come vices. And Lance's vice was women. Remember I said before that Lance was kind of like a dorky, short stature guy. He didn't get a lot of girls when he was growing up. But when he got a little older and when he got successful, he was able to have access, for lack of a better term, to all of these beautiful women that he never thought would pay him any time of day. But Lance got almost addicted to these women. By the age of 41, he was already on his third marriage and actually third divorce. Lance's third wife had actually just recently divorced him because he was cheating. He was all over town. He could not resist women and women couldn't resist him either. Not only was he famous and provided a lot of status, but his love language was gifts. So he would quite often shower these women with thousands and thousands of dollars of gifts. And they felt like they were up to maybe be the next Miss Herndon. But being the next Miss Herndon was not as great as it sounded. His first two wives, they didn't even make it to their one year anniversary. Lance was quick to get bored, quick to cheat, and quick to drop the divorce papers and offer a little bit of cash and send these ladies on their way. After two wives, he does not hesitate to rush into a relationship with a woman named Janine. To Lance's family and friends, Janine actually felt like the one that was the most promising. Maybe she would stay. In 1990, they were working on their dream home, which was a six thousand square foot house in a suburb of Atlanta called Roswell. This was a really nice kind of quiet but upscale neighborhood. A lot of their neighbors were also rich entrepreneurs, government people, anything like that. It was once again very high society 90s Atlanta. It's the dream. When they got married, Janine really admired the fact that he could build all of this. There was no map on how to convince people that tech was the future, especially in the early 90s. But Lance knew what he was doing. One thing that Janine really didn't like was his communication style or lack thereof. Remember earlier when I said that he would record the tapes and tell everyone what to do for the day? Well, he wouldn't really talk to them past that. He believed that communicating with the employees was kind of a waste of time. He kind of just wanted to tell people what to do and then go off and do his own thing. Janine felt like this was quite selfish. While they were working on their home, Janine was actually pregnant with their soon-to-be son when Lance once again lost interest. He started talking to other women, kind of unbeknownst to Janine at first, but the biggest thing was he stopped communicating with her too. And and once she found out that he was not only talking to other women, but sleeping with other women, she tried to tolerate it for a little bit, maybe for the sake of their family or for this bright future that seemed so amazing. But shortly after the birth of their son, she couldn't take it anymore because there was so much cheating going on and she decided to leave. Now back to Dion. Dion has just scored an invitation to Lance Herndon's 41st birthday in the downtown Hilton, Atlanta. She knows that the biggest socialites, the richest people all throughout Atlanta are going to be there. Remember I told you before, Lance was kind of part of the new rich. This was an old money. All of these people were freshly into money, ready to make a name for themselves, and they were popular. This was a hot scene to be in in the 90s. Naturally, Dion goes home. She finds her best outfit. She's doing her hair. She's doing her makeup because the goal was obvious. Find a man, any man at this party, somebody that maybe could take a little care of her on the side. Maybe it was husband number two. Whatever the case was, Dion had a lot of sex appeal and she was ready to lay it on thick. 
In April of 1996, she arrives at the party and it is a dream. There's shrimp cocktails lined up everywhere. There's exotic cheeses everywhere. There's servers and there's over 400 people here the beautiful people. It was in a glass enclosed room inside of the Hilton downtown in Atlanta. And Lance had basically rented this whole thing out for himself. This wasn't just like a boring little conference room. This was a stacked, layered party with hundreds of Atlanta's hottest socialites hanging out everywhere. And Dion came by herself. It, it's almost like a movie. Imagining her just walking in and seeing the servers go by with the shrimp cocktails and everything. And her just looking around I'm like, okay, I don't know anyone, but I gotta make this work. There was a big dance floor in the middle and everything was just lined up with all of these exotic pastries, expensive chocolates, champagne, bottles of wine everywhere. Everybody at this party was getting wasted and having a good time being rich and popular. And Dion was in the eye of the storm. While Dion is navigating the party and quite frankly, in awe of all of this, I mean, she's married with a kid and in college. These people are successful athletes, entrepreneurs. She ends up hanging out with one of her friends and watches Silk, which is an Atlanta-based kind of R&B group, very popular. They were hired for the party. They did a version of Happy Birthday at Lance's party. There were performances, there was dancing, everyone was talking. For nights like these, he's not making business deals. He's not chatting it up with other tech guys and finance gurus. He's sitting around with a group of women. Inside of Lance's wallet, he actually had a little slip of paper that had a bunch of names and phone numbers in case he wanted to call anybody up. But on this night, there's so many women around that everybody knows Lance is going home with somebody. Sometimes Lance would even go home with two women. That was pretty normal. He had a few different girlfriends at the time, and a few of them were invited to the party, one of which was a woman named Talana, but he wasn't really hanging out with her too much, and I think she was just happy to be there. But somebody caught his eye. It was a petite lady with hazel eyes, and she had been looking at Lance for most of the night, and he was interested. That woman was Dion Ba. Not only did Dion inch her way into this party that was invitation only and she didn't really know anybody, she ended up catching the attention of the guy himself, the big guy, Lance Herndon. And she had heard about him and she knew exactly who he was. And Lance waltzes over while everyone's dancing, the alcohol's flowing, the lights are going, the music's going. And Lance walks over and introduces himself. Dion's boss, who kind of bent over backwards for her earlier, he had actually let Dion sit at his table. He vouched for her and they hit it off. I don't think the vouch really mattered. Lance loved beautiful women. Now, I'm not sure if they went home together that night because I think Dion's husband, Sean, was actually still in town. She just didn't bring him to the party. But within a couple days, Lance was calling and Dion was showing up. They were dating and it was on. Dion turned on the passion and the sex appeal more than anything. That's what a lot of people in Lance's friend group kind of heard of. Like, whew, I've got the hottest girl right now. She had to secure this relationship by any means necessary. And not only was it doing something for her ego, but Lance was no stranger to giving gifts. Within just a couple of weeks, he bought Dion a brand new Mercedes. Before he got her the Mercedes, he was sending her cash, sending her lavish gifts. I mean, flowers, they weren't even on the table. I'm talking thousands of dollars. Lance at one point even gave Dion her own credit card. This is the 90s and he is spending 20, 40, 50, thousand dollars on her no problem and she's eating it up this is pretty confusing for her husband too because he leaves on one of his regular trips and he comes back and Dion's driving this Mercedes and he's like you were just driving this beat up little car a couple of weeks ago where did you get this Mercedes and she tells him oh I have this new business mentor and he felt really bad for me he was making fun of my car so he's letting me drive his car Sean's not really buying this story but he he doesn't know what to think. He and his wife had never had issues before and maybe some nice boss would just let her borrow their car. He asked questions, but 
He lets it go. The car was the first red flag, but Dion tries very hard to start juggling this life between Lance Herndon and her husband, Sean. Sean is usually flying all the way back to Jamaica and spending days, sometimes weeks away from home. And she has plenty of time to cheat. Even though the car was really alarming, Sean didn't start to really put the pieces together that she had to be cheating until he came home and she had all of these expensive, expensive luxury cars cars and she bought a four bedroom house. When he asked her about it, she said that she was saving up. He said, no way, no shot. That is impossible. Now I know you're cheating, but he didn't have any proof. And also they had a kid together and this was his wife. All of this is really confusing for Sean. And just right now he decides that he wants to take his daughter and go back to Jamaica. But this is exactly what Dion wants. Now she's free to go after Lance whenever she wants. She doesn't have to worry about a babysitter or staying home for her kid. Quite frankly, I don't even know if Lance knew that she had a child. She presented herself as a hot, single, sexy college student. And Lance was all about it. To him, he had this cute little secretary in his house with a little Jamaican accent. He could call her up and she would come over whenever. I mean, she would do anything for Lance. She really wanted to be the next Miss Herndon. She was this close to having the upscale life that she always dreamed of. I mean, she thought that dating or marrying a pilot was an ego boost. Well, she had Lance Herndon wrapped around her finger. And she was about to live the dream, or so she thought. Because there's one detail that Dion doesn't know. In fact, this detail didn't come out until later on. Do you remember when I said that Lance's mother was the bookkeeper for the business, Access Inc.? This company was a multi-million dollar company and Lance was spending tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars per month, depending on what was going on. He had to have somebody that he trusted going through the books and taking care of everything. And also, he needed to have somebody that could keep a secret because Lance was broke. The company account had absolutely no money in it. He was overdrawing credit cards left and right. He was in debt with credit cards, tens and tens of thousands of dollars. And also, he had just taken out a loan for 125K and the bank was already on him saying, you need to pay this immediately. Lance's mom was the bookkeeper. She definitely knew everything that was going on, but she just kept everything quiet, protected her son, who she loved very, very, very dearly, and made sure that the staff got paid every time. That was her top priority. But Lance was in a period of time where he was not only addicted to women, but he was addicted to spending money. Early on, he really did have millions and millions and millions of dollars to spend. He got accustomed to this extremely lavish lifestyle. I mean, when you think about it, he didn't even have the money to throw that crazy party that he just had. He had zero dollars. Lance Herndon was so broke that he was in the negative by about half a million dollars. After about two months, he starts to get a little bored of Dion, as he usually does with women. But not only was he bored of her, he had spent so much money trying to impress her to begin with that she expected about twenty or $40,000 to be spent on her each month between her rent, the four-bedroom house in Norwalk, between her tuition, between him buying her new clothes, everything. Dion had even changed her wardrobe. She wore very, very upscale clothes and she never wore the same same outfit twice. He knew that he had to make a choice and his ego wouldn't let him tell Dion, okay, we've got to cut back on your spending. He probably also felt like love for him was tied to money. Lance thought that if he didn't have any money, she wouldn't like him anymore. And quite frankly, uh, he was right. I mean, we all know that Dion was here for the money and the prestige. So because he's too embarrassed or doesn't want to take the hit to his ego to communicate it to Dion that he's broke and he cannot afford to date her anymore, given the precedent he set, he starts to ignore her. 
Remember, you and I know that he's broke. She does not know that he's broke. So she starts to take this sudden rejection as, whoa, hold on, what, what, what's going on? This had all been going on for about two months or so and she was already getting used to it. And she's like, wait, 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 don't take this security away from me. Don't take this beautiful lifestyle away from me. I need all eyes on me. I've destroyed my life for this and you will give it to me. So, you know, she's calling his office. He's not taking her calls. She's calling his house. He's giving her excuses. He starts to go cold on her while he's looking for a new prospect to date. And she feels suddenly like she's not good enough. She has absolutely no idea that the motive behind this all is money. And, I mean, his regular personality of kind of getting tired of people. Now, Lance is pretty easy for him to kind of move on from Dion because he had plenty of girlfriends, literally, in his pocket, on a little piece of paper in his wallet. One of them was this lady named Kathy Collins, who he had met in Los Angeles back in 1989. And, you know, she wasn't an overly serious thing. He kind of would describe her to people as like, oh, this is my public girlfriend. This is my trophy girlfriend. Like, she's very, very beautiful. But he, he didn't take her that seriously. It didn't seem like they were on a path to marriage or anything, but she did spend the night quite frequently. She even had clothes that were at his house. His employees and the staff at the house didn't really like her because they were constantly, you know, running her dry cleaning back and forth and taking care of her. And she wasn't a Miss Herndon. By the time of his birthday party, Kathy and him had kind of drifted apart, but he actually kept a photo of her on his nightstand. And he had no problem calling up Kathy and asking asking her to come over, chatting with her a little bit, but the relationship wasn't too tight at the moment. After he stopped talking to Dion, he was a little more focused on this lady named Talana. Now, for clarity's sake, in case anybody's familiar with this case, or maybe they dig into it a little bit more, one of the sources that we used to research this was a book called Redbone by a guy named Ron Stodgill. And Ron was incredibly, incredibly thorough. But within his book, he refers to Talana Carraway as Lacey Banks. However, in a lot of online articles and during the court trial, Lacey Banks was actually called Talana Carraway. So for the sake of this video, I will be calling her Talana. But but if you see other sources or you see the BET adaptation of this story, just know Lancey Banks and Talana are the same person. Now, she is kind of an employee of Lance's, sort of. He paid her out of pocket and she did a lot of small administrative tasks, but he met her through her doing some work for Access Inc. And once again, she is his type. And she quickly becomes kind of his new girlfriend or new fling. Look, you guys know these don't last too long, but he was pretty serious about her. He actually communicated to her because she was aware of Dion and Kathy. He said, you know, he was ready to break it off with both of them and he was really interested in her. How could she say no? It's Lance Herndon. So, you know, she frequently went to his house. She was able to kind of walk around the house wherever she wanted. He was very, very particular about things and didn't give people access to his full house. But Talana, he liked her. She could go anywhere and everywhere. He was so done with Kathy and Dion that one night she even saw him gathering up all of Kathy's clothes from the closet and taking them downstairs. And he said, I want these out of my room. I mean, she really took this as, oh my gosh, like I'm moving up in the world a bit. Great for Talana. Lana. Bad for Dion. She can feel herself losing grip on Lance and it's painful. It feels like she's being rejected. It feels like she's done something wrong, but she doesn't have the answers. It feels like the security is slipping. I mean, this house, this four bedroom house, this isn't fully paid for. She was making payments on it and Lance was making the payments. This is a disaster. But at the core of it all, she can't take the rejection. She's been laying it on thick and playing perfect girl for months. How could this happen? How could you not like me? How could you take this away from me? How could you not want to spend time with you? What is wrong with you? It's spinning. It's spiraling up in her. She starts to become a little bit more aggressive. She starts to call more and demand to talk to Lance. She's having almost episodes on the phone and other people are noticing. And he's writing her off saying, she's crazy. 
This is too much. He gets to keep the real reason why he's pivoting away from her close to his heart. He can start over new with Talana and spend a little bit less money, even though he doesn't have a dime to his name, but that's just the way that he operates. To him, Dion was too expensive and she was getting too needy and too angry. He was done with her, but she will not accept that. One night on July 10th, 1996, Dion gets all dressed up. She puts on her makeup. She puts on her lipstick. She puts on her outfit, the perfect one that Lance can't resist. And this time, she's not getting rejected on the phone again. She's not getting told no, he's busy again. She's showing up to his house late at night. But before she even knocks on the door, she spots another woman walking through Lance's house by the window, scantily clad, and she goes ballistic. Whatever plan she had was out the window, and she starts beating and screaming on his door. She's like, Lance, open up. Who the f*** is this? She's going absolutely nuts. The other lady sees this and is like, oh my God. She flies up the stairs to Lance and she's like, oh my God, there is somebody crazy outside. They're banging on the door. I don't know what they're saying. Who is that woman? And Lance says, I don't know who that woman is. I'm going to call the police. He never comes outside. He calls the police and they show up. She's still hysterical. She hasn't spoken to him. He hasn't acknowledged her. He is acting like he doesn't know her. The police arrested Dion and he still says in the criminal complaint that he doesn't know who she is. Now, at this point, they had met about six months ago. He paid her bills, took great care of her for about half of that time, and then she spent the last few months spiraling out of control. And this was a breaking point for her and for Lance. He was done. He couldn't take the drama. He didn't want to deal with all of this. He just wanted to talk to all these girls in peace and send them a couple gifts and then move on to the next one. That was his pattern. And shockingly, this had never happened to him before. And he was actually pretty pissed. He wanted the Mercedes back. And also, this is the point that he cut off her credit card. He was already planning to break up with her, but he made a new plan. He was going to help get her out of jail, help her clear up this trespassing charge, and then she was getting cut off permanently. He was scared and done. About a month later on August 7th, everything kind of started to clear up or at least slow down. He had cut her off completely and he was just done with it all. He was enjoying running his business, talking to his new kind of girlfriend, Talana, and everything was pretty okay. That day, Lance was out just being a socialite. He had gone to some kind of like Olympics festivities. And then later on, he picked up his grandmother from the airport. His grandma's name was Elver. She was 92 years old and she was dealing with pretty bad Alzheimer's. So she had always wanted to see this big fancy house that Lance had and that's what he picked her up to do. So he's working, he's seeing family. He's just doing his thing, pretty calm. Even though his grandma was kind of feeble and seemingly on her way out the door, Lance was so, so tied up in business. He was actually still close with his ex-wife and his ex-wife offered to take his grandma home and take care of her because he had some more business to tend to. I don't know if it was business because that night he saw one of his girlfriends again. He did care about his family, but his priority was always going to be money and women. After he's done with family time on this day, he goes back to the office and Talana, the semi-employee, she's still there working. She gets up, gives him a hug. She kind of gets the vibe that he wants her to be in employee mood. And so she's like, okay, you know, I don't know what it was. It seems like all of these people were pretty chill with being the other woman as long as they had the prospect of being mis- turned on because do you know what he asked her to do he asked her to jot up an invite for this event coming up for a woman named rachel morris she was an elementary school teacher that he had gone on a few dates with and he was saying that he wanted to get to know her more and talana's response was yeah i'm so done with kathy i'm so done with dion yeah totally i love that I'll, I'll set that up for you like he had already gone out on a few dates with rachel talana knew what it was and she was just like okay but i mean if that works out for them that works out for them Well, maybe, because that night, Talana left his house, or rather the office, at 10.37 p.m. 
When she got home at 11, she played an answering machine message that was from Lance. And he said a couple things. But at the end of it, he said, you know, you really ought to think about marrying me. When she got the message, she called him back at about 11 o'clock. He picked up and she told him, oh, you're so crazy. And they laughed about it, chatted a little bit and hung up. The next day, on August 8th, at 8 a.m., Holly and Zanya, two of his employees, come to the office and they have, to them, a shocking discovery. There's no tape on their desk. There's no instructions of what to do for the day. I mean, Lance was up every day at 4 a.m. without fail, setting those things up so when they got in the office at 8, they knew exactly what to do. Holly and Zanya are panicking. They can't get a hold of him. They're paging him. They don't see anything in the calendar. And I mean, he lived by his calendar and they got nothing. So they end up calling his mom and saying, hey, can you come check on Lance? We're, we're pretty worried, but also we don't know what he needs us to do for the day. Maybe he overslept. Maybe something's going on. So his mom comes over immediately. She greets them, talks to the ladies at Access Inc. And then she goes inside the house to go check on him because they weren't allowed inside the house. And while they're waiting downstairs for their boss to come down, they hear a horrifying scream. And it's his mom. They only hear the scream and they know not to go inside the house. And they're like, what's going on? What's going on? She had found her son bloodied and battered in his own bed. She called the 911 operator and just starts screaming, my baby, my baby. And they asked her, they said, where is your baby? Where's your baby? She gives them the address and they say, okay, tell me what's going on. She said, I came in the house. I found him bleeding. Hurry, please get here. The 911 operator wants more details, but this is her son. He is completely covered in blood and looks lifeless. She probably doesn't want to get any closer. That type of imagery, you do not get out of your head especially your son that you've raised and you've been looking at for the past 40 years and he grew into this amazing businessman that you were so, so, so proud of. And now you're looking at him in the worst state. She just couldn't bear it. She was understandably upset, crying on the phone, couldn't give them any more details. When they arrived on the scene, it was true. Lance Herndon had been murdered in his own home, bludgeoned to death over 14 times with some type of blunt object. Now, if you're a fan of Sinister, you probably know that, sure, this is a true crime show, but I don't like to go into extreme, extreme details about everything that's happening. To me, these are stories about people and their relationships and how they go off the deep end to somebody committing the worst act possible. There's no extraneous details, just kind of the core of what I think you as a listener might want to know. Here's some interesting things that they found at the crime scene. One, there was no sign of forced entry. Two, remember when I said Lance had those three alarm clocks that were all around his room? The clocks had all been unplugged. They were different types of clocks, but they were digital. On the first and second one, they weren't able to recover any information. But on the third one, it was actually frozen. And the time said that it was 4.10 a.m. Some of Lance's valuables were missing, like his laptop and a ring that he wore all the time. It seemed like it was some of his personal items rather than his expensive ones. And one key detail was that photo of Kathy, the girlfriend that he kept by the nightstand, it was faced down. Somebody had also taken a shower in his bathroom that evening, so it seemed like somebody that would be invited in, somebody that felt comfortable around the home, and somebody that didn't like the other women that he was talking to. Very clearly a crime of passion, so immediately they go to speaking to all of his ex-girlfriends. One of the first people that they spoke to was Janine Price, which was his ex-wife from the third relationship. Janine was a little suspicious because she had an 850 thousand dollar life insurance policy in Lance Herndon's name and she was still the sole beneficiary she would serve to get eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the event of his death but when they spoke with Janine she was just incredibly cooperative and it seemed like they had a good relationship because they still shared a kid together the interesting thing about this is even though that life insurance policy was incredibly hefty after their divorce Lance had to pay her five thousand dollars a month for their son who happened to be four years old all the way up until he turned 18. 
So roughly, that's about $840,000. But on top of that, he also offered to pay her about $10,000 monthly for a couple years after the divorce. So with all of the money added up, she actually stood to gain more from him being alive rather than dead. And because of her alibi and her cooperation, she was very quickly removed as a suspect. Talana was another suspect, but she actually showed up to the police station with an attorney because she knew she was one of the last people to see Lance alive. But she told them everything that happened that day from her, you know, sending the invitation to Rachel to her getting the voicemail from him. And they were also able to verify that she had called Lance that night and it looked like the call went on for a while. She remained home for the rest of the night, so she was removed as a suspect. Kathy Collins, the longtime trophy girlfriend that Lance had, she was actually with another guy that night, and they were able to confirm her alibi. But between Kathy, between Talana, between the ex-wife, one name kept coming up. And of course, that was Dion Ba. A couple people pointed to her, but not much came of it. They were actually pretty off the track because this was the moment that it was revealed how in debt Lance was. They combed through all of his finances and it was an absolute mess. After his death, Lance had a big funeral. One of his best friends that he had known for many years, he was like a prominent surgeon in the community. He kind of handled a lot of things and he decided that they should have a public memorial as well as a private funeral for friends and family. At the public memorial, there were photos and lots of sentiments about Lance. And then at the private funeral, it was a closed casket. His best friend actually had to see him afterwards in the morgue. And he said he cried and cried and cried because Lance's face had been so beaten beyond recognition. He told everyone, it has to be a closed casket. Between the service, the security, the casket, obituary, everything. It was pretty pricey, but you know, it was all in honor of Lance. He was a prominent figure in the community. But after the service, Zanya had to check the company's account to start paying off some of the bills. When she called, the teller told her that there were no funds in the account. In fact, the account was overdrawn by $12. This is unbelievable to Zanya and she's telling them, you know, check the numbers, check this again. Like there, there's there's thousands of dollars in there. This is a multi-million dollar business. It's one of the biggest in Atlanta. And the teller says, no, there's absolutely no money in here. In fact, you owe us a couple dollars. How would you like me to proceed? This baffles her, but everything slowly starts to unravel. It slowly gets revealed that Lance and his mom were just trying to keep their head above water. And anytime money came in, they prioritized paying the bills and paying the staff, paying the bills and paying the staff while she tried relentlessly to get him to spend a little bit less money. His plan was being frugal with the business, but still being lavish in his personal life. The staff is looking for solutions to pay for a couple of these things, and they called the bank and asked if they could sell some of the receivables to get a little bit of money or just get a loan up front. And the bank actually said, um, no, you owe us $125,000 and you need to pay this right now. We're not giving you a single other dollar. One of Lance's contractors ended up trying to sue to get his back pay and everything was just falling apart. They had to sell Lance's Volvo to make enough money just to get the staff some of their cash back and handle the other contractors. Lance's death was shocking and stressful, but the financial burden that he left behind was almost unbelievable. At one point, they were going through his papers and they found a tax return from 1994 that was prepared but never sent off. Like I said earlier, Lance Herndon died owing in excess of half a million dollars between unpaid wages and taxes. And this was after they sold all of his properties below market value just to get money back to pay off what they could. 18 months passed after his death that there were just no leads. You know, they were told to look into his relationships. They were so obsessed with the money. Did he owe someone something that they just kind of fell off of the trail and never really found anyone to pursue until 18 months later when Sean Nelson was divorcing Dion Ba and he decided to call in a tip to the police. Sean told police that during a really, really bad argument with his wife before he divorced her, she screamed at him and told him, I'll kill you just like I did Lance. Sean knew that she meant it. 
I can only imagine the spiraling levels of stress that she was feeling during the rejection, losing all of the money, after murdering someone, and feeling like she might have gotten away with it. The police take this tip very, very seriously. And now that Sean and Dion are getting divorced, there's the divorce proceedings. And at one point, Lance Herndon comes up as a portion of why they're getting divorced. But she lies to the court and she says that she and Lance were just friends. Well, this directly conflicts with what she told the homicide investigators before. And they decide to look into her because clearly she's willing to lie. As they start to dig more and more and more through Dion's contradicting statements and ask more and more people about her, they find out that Lance was looking to end the relationship with her and he was very serious about it. After the incident July 10th, which didn't get uncovered until way later in the investigation, they were able to finally place a motive as to why Dion would kill Lance Herndon. And with all the financials in place, it felt pretty solid. In January 1998, Dion Baugh was arrested and charged with the aggravated murder of Lance Herndon, finally, almost two years after the murders. The guards and attorneys said that in the first couple of days that she was there, she went into full-on hysterics while she was in the jail cell. They had never seen anything like it. A couple of reasons why were because, one, she didn't want to wear the jail outfit. She felt like she was too upscale for that. And two, she wanted bottled water. Somehow she cleared the $150,000 bond and she was released out of prison for a bit, but they worked to create a case against her and it was pretty strong. Some of the evidence was her DNA at the crime scene and also the financial record and the inconsistencies in her alibi. At her trial in 2001, she was facing a life sentence. This is where some of the details came out about how desperate she was to get the invitation to Lance's party. And they talked about how they met at the dinner table and just how much Dion was ready to turn it on. One of the state's witnesses was a detective named William Anastasio, and he was very adamant that Dion was a gold digger. She was a murderous gold digger, and he didn't really have very much tact with it. Her team was very quick to try to shut it down and say, that's hearsay, that's hearsay, you can't say that. But some of the other evidence was pretty airtight, one of which was she was in possession of Lance's laptop, one of the things that was missing that night. And two, the day after he died, Dion spent $3,000 on furniture on one of his credit cards. All she ever wanted was the attention and the money. But one of the biggest things that convinced the jury was Lance was a very, very clean, hygienic person. He always had to have his nails very manicured. He took multiple showers a day definitely before bed, and many people testified to his obsession with hygiene. But that night, somebody else's DNA was found underneath his fingertips, which was very strange for Lance. He was always so clean. This is not something that would have happened days before the murder. This is something that would have happened hours before the murder. They tested that DNA, and it was Dion Boss. At the end of her trial, the jury found her guilty of malice, murder, and theft on multiple counts. She was sentenced to life in prison in 2001. 